So today I'm going to talk about um, how to move files around on uh, the cluster we have access to, which is JHPC, and how to set up permissions on a specific disk, DCS4. Um, and so I've added new things to the team website um, on the uh, organizing your work um, chapter or section. And so um, as a bit of background, um, we've been trying to organize projects in a consistent way where we have like a code directory, a plus directory, process data, uh, raw data. Um, um, but we, we've been trying to do this inside of specific, like inside of each repository. But in addition to that, uh, since 2021, we started to put projects on there um, um, inside of a, in some disks um, that we have at JHPC, but with uh, project name underscore Libre grant number. And the idea of this is that like when um, JHPC admins check every month how much disk you're using and thus how much you should be charged, um, now, um, um, Aaron, who's at Libre, can uh, go through that invoice and automatically detect what are the grant numbers that should be charged for storing the contents of specific different projects. So uh, this like automatic system is a lot easier for um, like everyone involved, both finance and us. Um, like I don't need to keep track. Uh, of like, oh, 50% uh, of our storage comes from grant number one, 20% from grant number two, et cetera. It's done like automatically like that. Uh, so that's pretty nice. But in order to achieve this, like we actually need to um, move files around, sometimes like, across different disks. We might even have um, some backups on a different disk. Um, and then, once you're setting up a project, you also need to um, uh, set file permissions. And so I recently made, so like on Tuesday of this week, I made a template project. Um, we have a few new members in the team and in our collaborators. Um, and so this template project um, shows how to organize like the raw data code. It has a few um, examples that highlight some of the issues you might want to deal with. And this how to use template section explains like what are the files, what are like some key things you might want to be aware of. Um, uh, so that might be of interest to you, but then we get to the part of actually setting up file permissions. And so uh, um, this is um, like complicated in some ways because there are some properties that are um, specific to to Linux in general um, that um, uh, limit uh, the options we have. And so uh, JHPC is, is built on top of Linux and Linux has this concept called like a user group. However, like a user group is like a very democratic um, where like everyone in that user group has exactly the same permissions. So like there's no like group admin, um, um, like, um, yeah, so there's no one like in the group that can be like, hey, I'm gonna add these other people into the group or um, specify like if maybe a subset of the group has more permissions than, uh, than another subset. Um, um, and so in the past, we used this um, um, user group called Libre Jaffe um, because of Andrew Jaffe, who um, was the boss of a few of us at the time. Um, and this Libre Jaffe user group um, um, basically uh, grew quite lar large over time because every time we had a new member or a new collaborator, even if they only had needed access to like 5% of the data or projects, we gave them, we added them to Libre Jaffe. And so at some point, like there was like too many members on that user group. Um, 
and so then everyone had a read or write access to everything that uh, everyone else in that group had. Um, and so this comes into play for like maybe we're collaborating with like two different groups that don't necessarily collaborate with each other. Um, and so in the past, we had to give access to everyone. Um, um, and that became a bit tricky at times. Um, now, you can say like, well, the other option is to be very detailed and create a user group for every project, right? Um, so, you know, a user, a user group for, let's say, the um, chess brain project, a user group for the um, um, special BLPFC project, etc. cetera. Um, so that's what some people choose to do. However, um, we don't actually have admin, admin powers at JHPC uh, um, or root powers. Um, and so we cannot be creating user groups ourselves. So we need to actually ask um, JHPC admins to create a group, to add people to a group, to remove people from a group, et cetera. Um, um, and so that creates a lot of like um, communication overhead with, with JHPC admins in order to maintain a lot of user groups. And so a solution to part of this problem is to use what's called access control lists or ACLs. Um, um, and what this is useful for is ACLs allow you to have a directory, which is controlled by one user group, but then you can um, give access to a second or a third user group. And so that using ACL supports the scenario where like, uh, let's say you have a project where only one team wants to, uh, should have write and read access and everyone else should not have access to. Um, you can actually do this with, with regular um, um, user groups. So you don't necessarily need an ACL for that. But then this scenario for like two teams, you want to give them read and write access to a project that is actually supported by ACLs. Or the scenario for like the same two teams, you want to give them access to a project tree, but then a third team, you want to give it like read access. So not, not the same type of access. Two teams have read, write and read, and a third one only has read. Um, so that's possible with ACLs. Um, so, I here have a few examples. So nowadays, like my team uh, uses the Liver Elecoyal Tor user group. Um, and so first scenario is maybe we're working on a private project. Second scenario is maybe we're collaborating with the Liver Marmage page project. Uh, third scenario is maybe we're also collaborating with that same user group. Um, but then we want to make it such that like anyone on the Liver user group can actually read the files. Uh, but we don't want them to have write access because we don't want anyone from that very large user group to accidentally delete or modify our files. Um, so um, they do provide a lot more control. Um, and so some um, Linux commands that you might be interested in um, at some point is like, you can use get ent, I guess it's for get entity, I don't know. Um, space group and then space the name of a group. Um, and so this can be useful to see like, oh, who are part of this team? And so here, like I copy pasted like a recent output of it, where you can see Josh, Art, um, Nick, myself, Gio, Luis, and Brenda were part of this user group. You'll also notice that it shows a little uh, number over here. Uh, so that's actually like the user ID. And this will come into play in some of the scripts later on about like setting permissions. Um, although uh, JHPC admins have been trying to fix things such that like you only need to know the the user group name, not the ID for some commands. If you actually want to see like, okay, what are all the groups you belong to, you can um, type group space your name. And in my case, I like I belong to a ton of user groups. <laughs> um, um, so you can see that there. Um, if you're ever in doubt of like, oh, what user groups do I belong to? Now, now that we know about user groups and um, the general idea of what ACLs are, uh, let's actually start to use them. 
the complication here arises that like different disks um, have different uh, what is called um, disk file systems and uh, support different commands. So the original commands are like set, um, I guess, set file ACLs and then get file ACLs. Those are the original commands. But there's like a newer like um, file system, I guess, set of, uh, uh, of commands called the NFS4. Um, and so DCS4 is our um, most recent disk that we have access to. And JHPC admin is configured in such a way that like you can only use this uh, set of commands, which have their own like syntax that is slightly different from set FACL and get FACL. So because we're mostly only using DCS4, I'm only going to explain the commands for, for that version of the of file systems. Um, and actually, like it's not like I like Google and like found all this information myself. Um, I asked HPC admins, and they uh, they trained me over a series of emails. And so here you can find like the um, that set of email exchanges if you want to read more information that HPC admins provided. Um, so um, I eventually made some scripts that we use quite frequently for setting permissions. One of them is like. Uh, my team collaborates quite frequently with the Mark Mage Page user group, as well as the Higgs Lab user group. Um, um, so I have a script for setting up the permissions in, in a scenario where I want to give um, write and read access to all three user groups. There's a second one where like, uh, we work with the Libre Moods user group, but that we actually want the Libre user group to be able to see um, um, so I have two of those scripts and the short version is I made it easy for people to use where like um, just type sh the path to one of the scripts. So here is the one for the spatial team, which is the one with my team, Marmite page and Higgs lab, and then space the path to the directory where you want to set all these permissions. And that's the same syntax for the moods group. Um, um, now, having these scripts around is handy because a problem that I haven't been able to solve with ACLs, um, maybe I need to ask HPC admins if there's a solution for this, is that when you copy files to JHPC, for example, through Cyberdog, the ACLs are not actually respected. So you, actually, you have to like set them up again. Um, also, when you use the MV command, move command, um, ACLs are not respected either. Um, so if you use, if you upload files to Cyberdoc to JHPC or you use the move command, you will likely need to rerun those permission scripts that I showed above. And uh, this is most noticeable when like people upload a file manually, then version control it, and then suddenly like you can't, other people, someone else can't use Git anymore on that particular project. Um, so if you, some of you might have seen this, um, this scenario pop up across different uh, Slack channels over time. So let's look at the content of like this um, update permissions for the spatial team uh, script. Um, so I made it such that like um, it takes as an argument the path uh, that you want to update, and so that would be this dollar sign one. Um, um, and then after that, like over time, I added more messages because people were like confused about what's happening. And so what this is going to do is going to try to set um, the permissions for all the files and directories in, in that path. But you might not actually have permissions to set that up. Um, this happens with like projects that have files from many people. And so you'll get a lot of warning error messages, but those are expected. It's not like things are going wrong. It just means like you don't actually own everything. And so here we'll set up a read, write, then execute permissions for the Higgs lab. And so we, for each user group, there's three different find commands. So find is this command, um, Linux command that you can specify a path for it. 
and then you can say like what is the type of thing that you're trying to find so you can, you can either find uh, directories with d or files with f and once you find them we're going to execute a particular command here so in this case we're going to execute uh, the set uh, f acl command and you'll notice that the syntax here it looks a bit complicated where um, for files, what we're gonna say is, uh, we're gonna say like, I guess for all files, we're gonna say like on the group uh, permissions or ACLs, we want the Higgs lab and this cluster um, to have read and write permissions. Um, so that um, is these two over here. Um, that's for all the files. Then for the directories, um, we also want all of them to have read-write access. Um, so that's the same syntax here on line number one and line number three. The, the only difference is the X portion, for we want everyone to be able to uh, execute, um, have a, execute permissions for directories, which means like being able to actually like open the directories. Um, but then line number two over here has this extra piece, which is GFDI, which uh, I forget what it stands for, but it basically sets up the permissions to be recursive as you create more files or directories inside of the directory. I want to sneeze. Um, and so uh, I don't know if there's a more efficient way of doing this. Uh, where like, for example, maybe lines one and two can be combined, um, but you need to run like this find command three different times. Linux, I guess it's a bit smart because after you run find once, the next time you run it on that same um, file path, it runs a lot faster. Um, 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 and so, yeah, that's how we've set the permissions for Higgs lab. Then we do the same thing, but for uh, my team, Liber El Tor. Then the same thing, but now for Liber Marmaid page. Um, and so um, that's setting all the ACLs. Uh, later on, we realize that um, some of the files might belong to, let's say, the Liber Jaffe user group. So we also had to change what user group uh, the files were owned by. Um, and so this is a hierarchical if and else set of statements where I prioritize the Liber El Coyal Tor, which is like, you can notice here, I'm using the get and group portion. And so basically here I'm saying like, if your username is part of the Liber El Coyal Tor, then we'll uh, change the group with ch group to Liber El Coyal Tor recursively for that directory. Um, if, um, you're not part of Liber El Collado Tour, then uh, the next one will be Marmaid Page, and the last one will be Higgs Lab. Um, um, so uh, finally, after changing all the group, we set up what's called the group sticky bit, which makes it such that like any files you create later on inside of that directory, inside of our directory dollar sign um, one, um, will keep that same group um, name. Um, and at the end of all of that, we can check like, oh, how, how, did, it, you know, how did things look on that directory? Um, so the output of, of that command here will basically show again, some of those portions that we saw earlier about how to set permissions. So here you can see like, there's the AG for Liber El Coyote Tor. You can see there's a, a W for reading, for writing, an R for reading. There's a lot of other letters there that I forget what they are, but normally I just look for the R and W piece. Um, let me show you another one. Um, uh, Over here, you'll notice that the Liber user group has the R for reading, the X for, the X for executing, but it does not have the W for writing. Um, whereas Liber El Cuello Tor does have the W for writing. 
as well as the liver moods. Um, so um, early on, when like JHPC admins like created the CSO four, there was an issue where like you actually needed to know the group IDs. So when you typed this command, you would see like uh, let's say um, a uh, colon f dig colon then four two one seven at cm dot cluster and four two one seven was this um, ID for El Coyator. Uh, so at some point, I actually started to remember some of those numbers because <laughs> I was using these commands quite a bit. Um, and so that's the structure of this script that like updates permissions. And it's a sim similar example for the moods uh, um, scenario where we give read, write, and execute access to liber moods. That's the same commands that we saw earlier. Uh, we give read, write, and execute to liber el Tor, who we saw earlier. But now we only give read and execute, so not write, to liber. And so that's where like, you'll notice that there's no W over here. Um, now, the last thing is like actually um, the way I asked JHP, JHPC admins to set up um, uh, the directories where we work is to give also by default um, access to the liver marm page group. So in this case, I actually have to uh, remove permissions. And so you'll notice there's this dash X component that is different from the dash A that we used earlier. Uh, and then the same, the, the syntax is the same. I had to do it twice because like um, at some point, um, liber marmite page is, was like 4218. And this command was like, in a way annoying because yeah, if it showed up with a with a number, and then when you typed it with the name, it didn't work, even though the number is the ID for that user group. So that's why I had to do it twice here. Um, and then uh, uh, at some point, JPC admins changed some things, and I like didn't want to update the script. <laughs> uh, but that's a, the same syntax here. However, now the priority is given to liver moods. If you're part of liver moods, you, um, that is a group that gets assigned. If not, it's a liver el Um Cool. So that's how like you can set up permissions at DCSO4 with those uh, sets of scripts. And so like I provided these two examples because one of them is um, like, I guess the most commonly used one by our team, which is a spatial team. Uh, set of permissions, but then uh, the moods example provides an example where you want to give read and execute access to Liber, um, and you want to remove some default permissions like the ones we have for Liber Mar Mage Page. Um, um, and so this, um, I think, are the building blocks that you can use for many different scenarios. Um, so next comes a part of like actually moving files across JHPC disks. Um, so I added this section to the team website last night. Um, and you can, you might need up to the four different files when doing this. Um, um, one file lists in the directories you want to move. Um, this is an optional file. Yeah. Uh, but it's useful if you want to move a bunch of different directories into a single target directory using an array job. So I'll show an example of that. Um, then another script, which you will definitely need, uh, that's the one you uh, will always need, which is how you move files with a command called rsync. We don't use mv or move because it's error prone, um, if it dies in the middle of a run, it's like really hard to fix everything after that. Um, um, our sync, um, if it dies in the middle, um, you can resume it. Um, um, and like a difference is that move is actually changing one file's location at a time, whereas our sync just makes a copy um, and doesn't delete the original files. Um, um, so that's why it can be um, uh, easily resumed later. Um, 
and it has a lot of internal checks like it checks md5 sums uh, so like it also checks for like file corruptions when you move files then a third script for updating permissions so we already covered them in the earlier section um, but you will depending on like how many files you're moving you'll want to have a script for this and that's because when you're updating permissions for a lot of files um, as we saw earlier the update permission scripts have a lot of fine commands and those can take quite quite a few hours to run if you have a, a, a lot of files and then the last script is for deleting the original files um, however I would not run it automatically <laughs> I would like suggest that you wait a few days or even weeks before you run this. Um, that way you have a chance to make sure that like you're not missing anything after you move files. Um, and um, a lot of times, if you do not own the, if you don't have right permissions to all of the original files, you won't actually be able to delete them. Uh, so, um, and I can't delete them either. Um, like I said earlier, like user groups are like democratic. Everyone has the same permissions. So what we'll need to do is we will need to request JHPC admins to actually delete files for us. Um, and so this is a common scenario because like sometimes people leave the institute and we um, you know, now need help from JHPC admins to actually delete things that we no longer need. Um, so the first example I have here is a more complicated one. Um, I call it the QSVA example because that's the problem. Um, we're moving different data sets um, and projects related to this um, QSVA project into, into it. And so QSVA is a project from an R21 grant that we had, um, which had internal Libre code 3080. And so that's why I chose the name of the directory containing all the uh, files related to this project to be QSVA, which is a short name of the project on the score LIBD 3080. And so this is the information that Aaron uses when uh, they see like how much disk we're using at JSPC uh, in order to decide like what grant to charge uh, for our storage. Inside of it, I created a directory, which I call underscore JSPC underscore org for organization. And that's the same directory name that I use for storing any of these um, files about um, or scripts about uh, moving files, setting permissions, etc. Um, um, and so inside of it, there's going to be four files. One of them is this like text file that contains one new line for every original directory path that I wanted to move. So in this case, there were three from two different disks. From one of them is from the DCL01 AJAFI disk, and another one is from the DCL01 Liber AJAFI disk. Um, so these are actually two different disks that we're removing files from. Next comes the move um, script. And so here I have a, a bit of text explaining what uh, some specific parts of the, uh, of the script are, but I'll just show you on this video. Um, so, um, one thing I have here is that I changed the default uh, maximum file size to 400 gigabytes. I don't actually remember what's the largest file size we have in any of these projects. Probably nothing above 100 gigabytes, but I just set it to 400 um, in case like we I was moving like a very large file. Um, I still wanted to crash if, I, if it's like, you know, trying to move a one terabyte file or something like that, right? Nothing should be that big um, that we work on. Next, um, it's an array job because I'm using the dash T option. T here stands for tasks. Uh, so I'm saying like I want like three different tasks, one up to three, so in increments of one. So this will do one, two, and three. Uh, but then I don't want to, um, to put a huge burden on, um, on the network at JHPC. So I'm limiting the number of concurrent tasks. So that's the syntax TC uh, tasks that are concurrent um, to only two. Um, once we have that, I like have the typical information about printing, like who ran this, et cetera. Then um, 
inside of the Java script, um, I use awk awk to extract and R here is like the line number equal to the task ID. So I'm gonna extract like line number one, two or three from our uh, file specifying the directories that we're moving. Once I have that, then I extract like what is the, um, um, the actual like name of the directory we're moving and like the original path of where everything lived. After that, um, I use the du command, which is a command you can use in Linux for uh, computing file sizes. So I do that for the original directory, uh, but I do it with these options, sk and apparent size. And I do that because um, disks, uh, some of them have an automatic file compression to reduce um, um, the size of files. Uh, but that means that like, uh, if one this system has that and another one doesn't, or if they have different settings, then the file sizes are not gonna match across disks. Um, so here I wanted to know like the actual true um, size of the original directory. I compute that and it gives me a number that um, I need to divide um, in order to compute like the number of, of uh, terabytes that I can understand later. Otherwise, it gives me a number that like it's not really human readable. Then uh, Bill Ulrich gave me this piece of code because I wanted to list the owners of all of the files in the original path. Um, and the reason for doing this is later on, um, when you're debugging something, it can be useful to know who created a file. So you can go and ask them like, hey, I have a question about this file they created, right? Um, uh, and because we're using rsync, the destination of where we're gonna move all the files is gonna lose who created what. Um, so um, the owner or the, uh, of all the new files will be the person who transferred them. Um, so this uh, command over here helps me um, um, see like who are, who's the owner of all of the files. Then finally, we copy things. There's a few different options here that I won't get into. Um, but one thing we do is we uh, try to set the um, deliver El Coyote Tor as a new uh, group for all the files. And we'll move it from its original directory, in this case, into um, the target directory, which is this QSV LIBV3080 at the DCSO4 disk. Um, so once we're done moving all of the files, what I'll do here is I'll make a trash directory on the original home where everything lived. And then I'll move the, in this case, I'll use an MV command. So I'll just move the, the original directory into that trash directory. So that frees up the original file name um, or directory name, what we're moving, and allows me to create a soft link towards the new um, location on, um, on DCSO4, on the target directory here, QSVA LIBD3080 for the original directory. And this is nice because then it avoids disruption of any old code that might have used uh, full paths. Um, and then it moves everything into trash directory uh, of the original files. Um, such that later on you can be like, hey, like let's just delete that trash, right? After that, I run the an update permission script, um, which it could be as simple as a script that points to one of the permission scripts that I mentioned above, or it could be its own a specific set of permissions. So in this particular case, I wanted to remove permissions to Libre Marmy page, um, and then I actually wanted all the Libre user group to be able to read and access, but also the liver marmaid page, I wanted them to also read and access, but not have write permissions. Um, so that's what I did there. Um, the rest of it you might recognize. And finally, there's this delete script that um, we don't want to run immediately. It still has this hold a job ID syntax, such that like if you actually ran them all together, he would wait uh, until you're done moving before deleting. Uh, um, um, 
and yeah, it just deletes files from like the two original disks uh, on this trash directory. Now, it might be the case that you don't have the permissions to actually delete all the files. And at some point, you'll need help from JHPC admins. Um, so that's uh, the more complicated example. Then there's this human pilot example, which is a lot simpler, where like I only had two scripts. And that's because here I'm only moving one directory. So um, um, in this case, the code for it is libd001. That's because there was no grant associated with this project. And it was a collaboration with 10x Genomics. So that's why it's going to move into this with 10x directory. Um, so there's a move command over here, a move script that, as you'll notice, is not an array job in this case because it's, I'm just moving one directory. So I don't need the array job syntax. Um, so, but I use the previous script as a, as a structure. So I manually just specify the original directory instead of using awk. Uh, awk. Um, the rest of it, the rest of the structure is fairly similar. Um, but at the end, I move things into a trash directory um, instead of trash underscore QSVA. Um, that was just because I, I wanted to move different projects also there. Uh, and my updates permission script, you'll notice it's very simple. It just calls like the spatial LIBD uh, permission script and sets a path of uh, with the next. Um, um, I didn't actually key sub it because there, this project did not have a ton of files, so I didn't actually need to wait a lot of time to do it. Um, and so I think these are building blocks that you can use to specify what you want to move. Um, cool. So with that, I want to end for now. Thank you.